I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dykes, retired. Our submarine forces during World War II were constantly faced with the fact of the unexpected. Normally our subs patrolled so far into enemy waters that any aircraft sighted was automatically considered enemy. As the Pacific Fleet advanced to the westward and our air searches could be extended, our submarines found themselves diving to avoid friendly aircraft trying to contact them and our naval aviators sometimes mistook our submarines for enemy. Our story deals with one such incident. An important hunting ground for our submarines during World War II was the South China Sea. There they were rapidly eliminating Japanese shipping. In the same area, based on the recently liberated island of Mindoro, a Navy squadron of patrol planes under the able leadership of Commander Harold Red MacDonald also searched the South China Sea for the enemy. The relays these planes, which had become known as the Blue Raiders, kept up the hunt. Slow-flying patrol planes, often beset from the China coast by an aircraft fire, Japanese fighter planes, and the guns of Japanese warships. Yet they found and sank their share of targets, and when they were overmatched in gunpower, tried to report them. But because of the lack of sufficient coordination between aircraft and submarines, messages were often received too late, or the plane succeeded only in alarming the submarine into diving. Here's a bridge! Dive! Dive! That's about the size of it, Gordon. Except I was fit to be tired when we surfaced later and I saw the markings on that plane. I know. It was one of ours. He was probably trying to give you the freighter's position. Yeah. Give me position on a Maru I was already tailing. The nicest, biggest, fattest one I've seen in months. Well, we never did find it again. Well, that's tough, Ben, but uh, you're not the only one. Take a look at these. All squawks about the lack of air sub-coordination. What do you think it would take to get them to lay off, let us do our jobs? Maybe they're thinking the same about us. The next time I go out, I'd like to have one of those fly boys on board. Let him see what we go through to make a kill. Hello, Jarvis. Admiral Fife, how are you, sir? Fine, fine. Uh, tell me, Gordon, what's Ben got on his mind? The patrol planes from Mindoro, sir. Then you'll be happy to know that I've been talking to the patrol wing commander about it. I sure am, sir. And we came to an agreement, Gordon. We'll be glad to consider any plan that you and McDonald work out. McDonald and me? Exactly. We've got to send someone up there, and you have the background for it. Background for planes? Your four successful patrols as captain of the puffer and your staff experience should give you a good idea of the overall picture, and Red McDonald knows patrol plane operations inside out. Between the two of you, you'll come up with something. He's an old friend of yours, isn't he? Well, yes, sir. We went to prep school together before going to the Naval Academy. Good. You're assigned to Mindoro, submarine liaison officer. On the way, report for briefing at Lady. I want you to start tomorrow. Aye, aye, sir. Admiral, uh, you've flown combat with the Air Boys, as I remember. Oh, yes, several times. And I know this coordination can be improved. Good luck, Gordon. Thank you, sir. Jarvis. Good, bro. What a spot for a submarine man. In a nest of flyboys. Yeah, and I uh, seem to remember that they feather those nests with the best of everything. So if you think of me, Ben, think of a little deluxe living in my home away from home. <laughs> Anybody's home. If he isn't, he's sure to be back soon. Just go on in and make yourself comfortable. Gordon, what do you say, boy? Welcome to our tropical paradise. Red, you old son of a gun. How's the world been treating you? And the Blue Raid. Oh, we're getting by. I've been expecting you. Make yourself at home. 
I know it's not the Waldorf, but at least we've got a floor. A floor? Nobody else has got one. Just sand decks. Floors are command level stuff around here. Well, you'll be bunking with me so you can stow your gear over there. And take off that jacket before you fry. <laughs> What's the matter? What's so funny? Oh, nothing, nothing. Nothing at all. I uh, was just remembering something I said to one of the boys just before I left. That's Tom Barrett. He's due now. He flies those boxcars like they're fighters. I never know what to expect. I hope so too, Red. Well, I may as well brief you on the rest of the facilities around here. We also have a shower. No need for a man not to freshen up when he wants to. A shower? <laughs> oh, no, not in the air. Down the street that leads to the native village. You mean that open air job I saw when I came in? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty ingenious, isn't it? No need to make a reservation. All you gotta do is just stick your head out the door and take a look down the street. Have much of a gallery when you use it? At first they did, yeah. Now the natives go right on by without taking a second look. I suppose they briefed you at Lady on our setup here and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh-huh, that's right. I, uh, I have a few ideas, but I, I don't want to go shooting off my mouth till I've had a first-hand look. You know, watch some of the boys go out in a few flights. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Commander, I didn't mean to butt in. No, oh, come on in, Tom. This is Commander Selby, Admiral Fives headquarters. Gordon, this is Tom Barrett. Glad to meet you, sir. Glad to know you, Barrett. Where'd you get that? Uh, just after I radioed and headed for home near Saigon. A Zeke made a pass, but we drove him off. Well, maybe you better stay off duty tomorrow. Give that arm a chance to heal. No need to, sir. There's not much of a wound. Well, suit yourself. When you go out tomorrow, Commander Selby would like to go along. He's going to straighten out the confusion between our planes and the submarines. I'm all for that. Well, I'd like your slant on the problem, Tom. Commander, you should have been with me a couple of weeks ago. I just finished a sweep along the Chinese coast and was heading back. I spotted this uh, big maru. I was too low on gas to take care of it myself. And I spotted a sub on the surface, one of ours. I uh, dived toward her. And down she went. By any chance, Commander, were you aboard that sub? No. No, I uh, got the story from the sub-skipper. And uh, to use his very words, he was fit to be tied. But if I recognized him... Did you ever try identifying a plane from the bridge of a submarine? No. Well, you were diving, which made him suspicious. He couldn't wait around to find out whether you were a friend or enemy. No, I guess he couldn't. I uh, don't like to hurt your feelings, but uh, he was already after that ship. Well, all I can say is it's gone too far when we're both on hand and the enemy gets away. Let's get on the ball. The planes went out on their long 10 to 12 hour search missions and Commander Selby went out with them. First with Lieutenant Commander Barrett and then with other pilots. He shared the tension that came from the long hours in the air, much like the tension that goes with warfare under the sea. He was with them when it seemed like the time and effort expended were wasted because no enemy vessels were sighted. And he was with them when the search was rewarded, when enemy ships were located, and when no submarines happened to be in the vicinity. When the crew saw a fat prize below and were frustrated because they dared not take their slow plane within range of the accurate anti-aircraft guns of the escort ships. With his indoctrination into the problems of the aviators, the ideas came taking shape in his brain and making him feel sure that with the help of Red McDonnell, a better plan for coordinating the work of both planes and submarines could be devised. Now let's go back, Gordon. Let's start with the big headache. I don't know where your submarines are, and you don't know where my planes are. All right. We'll exchange information as often as we need to. We'll include it when we brief the pilots and the sub-skippers. That way, at least, they'll be able to recognize each other. But uh, what I'd really like to do is carry it a step further. You mean plane spotting the targets and calling in the submarines to make the kill? I understand that's been tried and never worked. Why not? Planes were never able to reach the subs by radio. They were usually submerged. Any more coffee in that pot? Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Now, wait a minute. 
I think I've got it. Let's say we put uh, three subs in this sector. Let's keep one on the surface 30 to 35 miles off the coast. Now the plane starting the search talks to him blind, medium high frequency, giving in code the approximate time of arrival in the sub's area. A sub wouldn't have to give away its position by answering. Exactly. Now, after the search, the plane heads back towards the sub. When he's close, he opens up on a very high frequency voice, reporting to the sub. Now the sub can talk back. So far, so good. Later, sub number one can pass along any hot dope to the other two subs on the wolf pack frequency when they surface, and then on to the next sector of three subs. Sounds workable to me. I think we ought to ask your boss for a fast OK. No, it'll work all right. It'll be like fitting submarines with remote control periscopes. Uh -huh. You mean planes with remote control torpedoes? Well, I don't care how you put it, as long as it's tough on the opposition. When Lieutenant Commander Ben Jarvis took his submarine, the USS Bayer, out to sea for their next patrol, he had been fully briefed on the plan. Take the con, Bill. I'm going below to get some rest while I can. Aye, aye, sir. This operation is different than anything we've tried before. I want to be on tap when they contact us. Call me in an hour. Aye, aye, sir. Finally, the day came when the plan would get the only test that mattered, use against the enemy. We've got to make this work, Gordon. Coast watchers have spotted this convoy, and I want you to have a look at it. Right. If you think it's important, that's good enough for me. I'll pull the other planes out of their sectors and keep a continuous surveillance so we can keep the submarine supplied with information. Good luck, Gordon. Good hunting. Thanks, Red. Commander. It sure is. Look how low those ships are riding in the water. Probably taking a lot of oil home to Tojo. Sailing northeast, eight, maybe ten knots. Probably Saigon to Yokohama. Better turn back and pass the word. Send this message. Important enemy convoy sighted. Position 1031 North, 10814 East. Base course 049. Speed 10 knots. Recommend continuous surveillance. Out. Bearcat, this is Hawk 1, over. Bearcat, this is Hawk 1, over. ETA, your position, 1630. Repeat, ETA, your position, 1630. Out. that time. We ought to be getting something pretty soon. Bearcat, Bearcat, this is Hawk 1, over. Bearcat, this is Hawk 1, over. I'll take it. Hawk 1, this is Bearcat, over. Hello, Ben. This is Gordon. Gordon, what are you doing up there with the Flyboys? Over. Just trying to scare up a few targets for you, Zal. And if I have to go up into the air to do it, I will. Would you like anything special? Over. I'll settle for a medium-sized crater. Over. Uh, how about a convoy, Ben, with the escorts heading northeast, China coast? Over. Great. Northeast China coast. Over. Position 1031 north, 108, 14 east. 
Base course, 0, 4, 9. Speed, 10 knots. Over. Roger. Base course, 0, 4, 9. Speed, 10 knots. Over. Relay message to Tiger Cat and Tom Cat. Good hunting. Out. Well, we got the wheels in motion at least. When we get back, it'll be my turn to take a day's rest. How about using your influence so I can go out with you again tomorrow? Well, fair enough. You ought to be in on the kill. You have to foul up the air with that stuff? Now you stick around here for a while to develop a tolerance for it. I'd rather have the bugs. Mission accomplished. You know, you ought to get some shut-eye. Oh. How about you? Well, not yet. I'm waiting for another report on that convoy that you and Barrett spotted. Well, with luck, we ought to nail it tomorrow. I think Barrett ought to be on that. He's overdue for arrest. So are you. I don't think I'm doing a harm to postpone it for a while, though. Well, thanks, Red. Barrett will like that. That'll be pretty close. We'll keep circling. Aircraft on the port bow. It's one of ours. Probably circling to indicate the target area. tanker first. Don't go. We'll give a spread of three fish watchers. One at the bow, one amidships, and one at the stern. Yes, sir. Stand by forward. Set torpedo depth at 10 feet. Stand by forward. Set torpedo depth at 10 feet. Up, go. This is a shooting observation. Bearing. Mark. Zero one five. Range. Mark. One two double oh. Set. Shoot. <laughs>
down by the stern. Two fighters in that flying bathtub? Two fighters confirmed. I saw him hit the water. And it wasn't a flying bathtub today, Red. Not the way he was handling it. Thank you, Commander. The blessing's on a couple of gunners that knew how to shoot. I understand we did all right down below today, too. All right? It was six out of six. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the man who was one of the key figures in this effective demonstration of air sub-coordination, Captain Gordon Selby. Gordon, I've been meaning to ask you, are you doing any more flying these days? Well, some, but nothing that compares with bumping along in those old patrol planes hour after hour. Kind of rough, wasn't it? Man doesn't realize how rough until he's experienced it. Red McDonald really had a crack outfit back there in Mindoro. The pilots were a little older than the carrier boys, they flew these big planes like flighters. Lieutenant Tom Mulvihill of Columbus, Montana was a fine example. I understand they won the presidential unit citation. If every unit deserved it, those boys did. Their citation stated that they destroyed thousands of tons of Japanese shipping and shot down 63 hostile aircraft. All combat duty is tough. Those two Navy crosses you were awarded while in command of the Puffer weren't exactly for shore duty. Maybe so, but believe me, when those tracers from Japanese machine guns were coming at us, I was sure wishing I was down below on that submarine. Well, as the old saying goes, life begins at 40 fathoms. Gordon, congratulations to you and the others who took part in this operation on a very fine piece of work. Thank you, Tommy. I hope you'll be with us again when we bring you another true story of the silent service. Mm -hmm.